Uh, today we will study an interesting class of fluid phenomena. And as a warm-up, uh, I want you to, have a, to see a, some nice example here. So here we see a diver at the bottom of a lake releasing air bubbles. And these air bubbles then quickly roll up into rings that trap the air inside of them. And closer observation actually reveals that the ambient fluid is actually spinning around these bubble rings. And looking closer, uh, the evolution of these bubble rings is quite complex. And here, for example, we see the complicated interaction between two bubble rings. And upon contact, these bubble rings merge, and the thickness varies along the filament, meaning that these vortex filaments do not have constant thickness along them. So as I said, this is a vortex filament. And the next example of a vortex filament can look very different. Here we see a drop of ink being dropped into water. And we see another formation of a spinning ring. But this time, it is ink that is being trapped inside. And we also notice that this ink ring accumulates ink into like blobs, which break down into further generations of these uh, ink rings and thus form a so-called ink chandelier. And both of these bubble rings and ink chandeliers belong to the vortex filament class and have been studied uh, for a long time, for example, by Thompson, uh, who in 1885 conducted an experiment on these ink chandeliers where he carefully studied the transition of a drop into a vortex ring. And this vortex ring at the bottom here is really the star of the show that we want to simulate. And already Thompson noticed that the dynamics of these intricate shapes are related to the viscosity of the fluid. And generally, these vortex phenomena are very common in nature and are known as vortex filaments, which are curved shapes where the vorticity is concentrated, which, for example, show up in the wakes of a plane or in smoke when it starts rolling up. Or even if you just move your hand like this, you end up creating vortex filaments that you can visualize through smoke. And sometimes even vol volcanoes can shoot out vortex filaments, which is nice. Um, the theory of vortex filaments has a long history and has been studied by the likes of uh, the people such as Cauchy, Helmholtz, Thompson, and Zafman. And in computational fluid dynamics, uh, the theory has been applied uh, by Chorin, Angelides, and Aret, Weismann, and Pinker, and Liao, just to name a few. And here in this video, we see on the right the simulation of vortex filaments being run. And on the left, we see the velocity fields that is being created by these. And we have to notice something important, because in the application in computational fluid dynamics, uh, there was always the assumption that the fluid is inviscid. And there is also the assumption that uh, the thickness of the filament is constant. And on top of that, gravity and buoyancy are not added directly into the dynamics of the vortex filaments. And this is what we're going to change today, because we actually want to describe an equation of motion that describes all of what I just said. So we want to have variable thickness along the filament. We want to have gravity and buoyancy automatically in the filament dynamics. And we want to have viscous effects on the vortex filament. And we are motivated to do this because we have seen these cool videos before. And they showed us that the, constant shouldn't, uh, the thickness shouldn't be constant and that Gravity plays a role, for example, in the bubble rings, and viscosity is what is required for the uh, dynamics of these ink chandeliers. So let's get started uh, with the math battle that we have to, or that we have in front of us. And so we want to talk about the filament dynamics. And in order to do this, we represent our filament geometry using mappings gamma from the unit circle to uh, 3D thick curves with annotated thickness along the curve. And we have to imagine that the vorticity of the fluid is now concentrated inside that curve. And we also assume that this vortex filament is thin relative to its extent. And now we want to have a look at the space of all filament geometries. So a space of, with all of these mappings. And then one point in this space represents a mapping from the unit circle to a 3D curve. Uh, and so this is a curve representation. Okay? And if I now carefully, slowly move the point 
along the manifold, I smoothly deform the curve, okay? Because this is a smooth transition on this manifold. And what we have to understand now is that the filament dynamics that we want to describe uh, can be, it has to be a path in this manifold. And we, and we want to be able to describe this path and the equations of motion that I mentioned earlier that we are seeking exactly are the ones describing this path. And you might have noticed we haven't talked about the vorticity, the strength of the vorticity, because for fluid dynamics, uh, we have to talk about how much vorticity is concentrated in these uh, vortex filaments. And for that, we have an extra parameter called the circulation. And it is at the moment just a constant number C that is given to each filament. And we see here the velocity field induced by the given vorticity in that curve. And this is just one velocity field that uh, describes the curve dynamic, but there have to be more components. So we just described the so-called Biosava field given by the circulation, which you can imagine like a rigid core model uh, rotating the vortex tube. Uh, but there have to be two more. Uh, components into the velocity field, and one of them is the tangential motion, which will be, in the future, responsible for the uh, distribution of thickness along the filament. And the next uh, filament velocity uh, field has to be the normal motion, which will describe how the uh, filament is deforming. And this will carry many of our new dynamics. And for a detailed justification about how we derive these uh, velocity fields, we refer to the paper. Okay, so let's go back, let's go back to the uh, manifold with all these filament geometries. And we notice with our velocity model, we can now describe the fluid energy. And it, is, it consists of two terms, and the, the first term can be understood as a kinetic energy on this manifold, because it has this quadratic form, and this is very nice but I've marked the second term red because it's really bad, because it doesn't allow us to uh, encode the entire energy as a kinetic energy. And the second term is the one that comes from the Biosava velocity field, uh, from the circulation. And what we have to do now is, well, we could stop here and try to find a different way to solve this problem, or we can do something radical in order to actually get the kinetic energy encoded uh, the way we want. And this is actually what we're going to do, because the second term doesn't have a time derivative in it, but we want it to be sort of, of a time derivative. So what we do is we take our manifold M, we extend it by some carrier dimension theta that carries the circulation in its derivative. And by doing this, we can actually manage to describe the same fluid energy as a kinetic energy, because we can now find a scalar product that fulfills this equation, and now this variable c is actually part of the velocity inside this extended manifold m tilde. And why do we do this? Because if we have a system that can be described solely by the kinetic energy, we can actually, by the principle of least action, uh, derive equations of motion for force-free motion, just by its own inertia. So this is really nice. So this gives us an equation of motion, but was it right what we just did, this, this trick? And actually there are consequences, and we have to be very careful about them, because by choosing this new scalar product, we have introduced new effects into the dynamics. So this equation of motion for force-free motion is not that simple. And actually, if we spell out this equation of motion by projecting it into back into the space of all filament geometries, we observe that the filament actually experiences an effective force. And what is very surprising is that we can actually understand these effective forces physically, because they come in two parts. One is the lift, uh, which is known related to the kota yukovsky lift force that keeps airplanes in the air. And the other force term is, uh, comes as a additional pressure effect from the varying thickness along the filament. And what is really cool is that both of these forces are actually predicted by Zafman and Moore in 1972 for vortex filaments with variable thickness. But back in the day, they never managed to derive 
uh, equation of motion, which we now have established. And, but in this higher space M tilde, and these forces came in for free. So, but we are not done yet, because we, those are not all the forces we actually wanted. The forces that we want are gravity and viscosity as well. And in order to implement them, we really just have to think that we are a point, we have this point in some space, and we have a kinetic energy, and when, then we just have Newton's laws of motion, uh, mass times acceleration equals force, and the force that we're now going to add is a conservative force through a potential energy, and the uh, viscous uh, force that we add is just a linear drag model. And this is actually now a e valid equation of motion for what we were looking for. So now we can really solve for the filament dynamics in this higher dimensional space M tilde. And we went into this higher dimensional space M tilde because this allowed us the formulation using this Newtonian dynamics. And then we can project back down the results we get there in order to see the filament dynamics and the circulation dynamics because this new dimension was encoding the circulation and now we can actually extract that from this higher dimensional space. So this actually gives us the equations of motion that we derived. And the first equation of motion I want to show is the circulation equation. So it describes the change in the strength of the vortex filament. And to our knowledge, this has not been explicitly written down before. And we see, very interestingly, the first term describes how the motion of the filament, the deformation of the filament, can actually create circulation. And this is quite a surprising result. And the second term describes how the thickness influences the circulations through drag. And the second equation of motion we have uh, describes the deformation of the filament geometry. And this is quite big and quite a lot of information, but we notice that the first term is given by this bio savart velocity field. And what is interesting is that if we were to assume that viscosity is zero and gravity is zero, this entire equation would collapse to just this very first term. And this is consistent with previous vortex filament methods. So this is really an extension of what was done previously. And the new terms that we now have in this equation describe the lift acting on the vortex filament, the flow of thickness along the tangential part of the filament, and an additional normal component describing the effects of gravity that are not tangent to the filament. And that was it for the math battle, and now we can finally move on and uh, actually just implement these equations. And in order to do this, uh, we talk about how we discretize our system. So the vortex filaments, uh, we represent them as polygonal curves, and the thickness is stored per edge, and the circulation is stored per filament, and the entire simulation is simply run by Runge-Kutta fourth order, uh, which is really efficient because we are only having curves and we only have to set, sample some points on the curve in order to run the simulation. And as you notice here in this video, there's something missing that I haven't talked about yet and that is the topological change that we see. Uh, so for example, for the bubble ring reconnection, we rely on the filament reconnection model by Weissmann and Pinkel in 2010 which compares the change in the velocity field with the change in the length of the filament and reconnects if a given ratio is met. And we see that in practice this works quite well on a zoomed up close-up look at this simulation. And for the ink chandeliers there is something different going on because we have seen that ink mass accumulates in a blob and then this blob actually turns into a new ink drop and just like the initial ink drop, this ink drop rolls up into another vortex filament. So what we do here is that once a lot of mass has accumulated locally, we trigger a new topological in instance of a vortex ring. And in practice, this is really important in order to get the repeating nature of the ink chandelier working. Okay, now we finally get to the results and see whether all this theory really works. And we come back to the diver who was chilling at the bottom of the lake. And we see that his bubble rings are rising, expanding, and thinning. And we notice that our simulation does that as well. And 
we have to emphasize that our simulation really only works with physical parameters. So we use the actual velocity, uh, viscosity of water and the actual gravity and all these uh, motions are a consequence of our, uh, our equations of motion. Next we have a bubble ring that we shoot out vertically and we see that it's turning nicely and then coming up in a horizontal setup. And this is something that is of course an effect of gravity and with previous vortex filaments none of this would have happened and would have been pretty lame previously. And next we show the simulation of the initial video that we saw. And we notice that the topological changes uh, match up really nicely. So, and next we show another bubble ring reconnection. Cool. And next uh, we want to look at the ink. And here we see the initial frames before the ink starts breaking into more rings. And we see that the deceleration happens nicely. So the circulation equation that we derived works well. And we also notice that the mass accumulation in blobs happens automatically with our model. And next we see the full transformation of an ink ring into a full ink chandelier, which is, seems to work out. Okay. And now you're probably wondering what's the performance. For the bubble rings, we have between 40 and 170 vertices. And the number of vertices changes because we have a resampling method that uh, resamples the curve for a consistent resolution. And for the bubble rings, we have a lot more vertices. But the computation is actually a bit faster there because we don't have to test for bubble ring reconnection, like uh, in the example before. And now we come to the conclusion. Uh, in this talk, we just uh, derived a more complete vortex filament model, one that now also respects variable thickness, viscosity, and gravity. And this has really increased our physical understanding of these vortex filament dynamics and has allowed us to recreate realistic simulations of vortex dynamics phenomena, such as the bubble rings and the ink chandelier. There is, however, more work to be done because we have not paid attention to the effects of surface tension, especially uh, upon the breakdown of bubble rings, which would be really cool to animate. And our model has only described the deformation of the vortex filament, but we have actually not, com not computed the velocity field for particle advection. And this would be really cool, because then we could also, one could also simulate the trailing of ink being shed of the vortex filament, which is nice for having these uh, blue ink coming behind uh, as a tracing, as a dome or something. Okay, and all our algorithms are implemented in Houdini and can be downloaded right now from our project page. And with this we come to a close and I thank you very much for your attention. And again, we have plenty of time for, uh, for questions. I can... Uh, I don't know. Oh, microphones. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marcel. Great talk. Thank you. Um, so you showed uh, these topological recombinations and splittings. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if there are any really interesting topological invariants of this dynamics, even with the apparent changes in topology. Uh, topological invariants of the yeah. bubble rings? Of this dynamics of the bubble, or of the vortex filament. Um, good question. Actually, I'm not sure what, what exactly you mean with this. Okay, maybe. Okay, maybe talk. after the talk, come. I, I actually also have a question. So yes. in, the, um, in the footage where you, you, you're comparing the, the diver with your sim, yeah. um, first of all, the, the resemblance is, is striking. It's very impressive. But there's there's clear oscillations on mm -hmm. the. Fr is that due to the lack of surface tension? Uh, oscillations the in the in the real footage or in the in the real footage. Ah, I, I guess this is more of a noise thing because uh, in our simulations the fluid is perfectly still the ambient fluid, and it's just the effect of the vortex filament. But in the lake the fluid is probably never still, and so there's always 
a bit of noise coming over to the vortex filament. Okay, so but related to that, then the fact that you're not accounting for for surface tension, mm -hmm. wh what does that mean? What is that? Uh, it means that. What is the effect you're not capturing? Uh, I think the effect that we are not capturing is that once the uh, vortex film, the bubble ring becomes thin, it might actually snap, and uh, we have seen videos where even singular bubbles can actually move along the bubble ring. But I'm pretty sure that this has an effect on the dynamics, especially on the gravity, for example. And especially when the circulation is thin, uh, this uh, very small, I mean, then this snapping can actually probably break down the bubble rings and then they dissolve. Hi, uh, very nice work. Thank you. So, um, as I understand, the uh, vortex ring has a constant circulation across the entire length just because of the nature yes. of vorticity. So, if you have a reconnection between two vortex rings that are colliding but they have different circulations, yes. what happens? Good, good question. At the moment, we average out the circulation depending on how big this was. But, uh, uh, yes, it's an interesting question because theoretically they, the circulation should be a constant along the entire filament, but in practice there has to be some spatial awareness of something inter of the interaction. Okay. So is there a theoretical or like practical what is known as what happens in real life? Hmm? Um, interestingly, the filament reconnection model that we used it, uh, really demanded that the circulation has to be the same on both vortex filaments. Okay. Very interesting talk. Thanks. Thank um, you. The linear drag model, is this um, sort of a choice of yours, or is this like the, the correct thing to do? Like, how does it relate um, to the strain rate of the velocity? The, the idea uh, how we got to it was because uh, the energy dissipation in the fluid is proportional to the, or is given by the L2 squared norm of the uh, vorticity. And we have used this as a model to uh, then compute the drag tensor. And yes, uh, we assumed that the linear drag model is sufficient to describe this. So does it tie you to like a particular reference frame uh, or something like this? Like, uh, like if I have a moving reference frame, it's, it's, uh, like it's linear with respect to some, some zero somewhere, right? Um, to the reference frame of the moving filament would probably be the right yeah. idea. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>